and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Romsed, and welcome to part two or part B of our lecture regarding El Norte. So as we left off, yes, there were some definite positives of going northward. There were some new opportunities, and yes, they were able to recreate some culture and maintain culture through things like the DAC-6. And again, you know, we'll talk more about that in future lectures. But again, let's be very clear. Things were not all roses in the north. Let's take it from civil rights activists in Michigan Women's Hall of Fame inductee, Mary Lou Alaveras Mason, who describes working in the fields. She said, quote, it was hard work, sun up to sundown, all day long, out in the sun. I mean, there were no trees or anything in the middle of the fields. It was just open fields. We hated those fields. We hated those fields with long, long rows. It seemed like you would never see the end of a row. You'd sit in the middle of a row and you look and you couldn't even see the end of it. That's how long the rows were. We had to take water with us. The person that we went with, they would bring cans or containers of water in the fields for us. Now, of course, the water would be hot. There was no shade or trees. I mean, the water was like soup, but at least it was water. That water kept us alive, unquote. She then went on to describe how she'd be dropped off in the fields in the morning and that if anyone got sick while in the fields, you'd have to wait around until the truck came back around. So the most common issue was sunstroke because you're out there in the sun a lot. And of course, with babies, some of them are sort of having vomiting and diarrhea. They get dehydrated. And of course, we know what's going on. They understood it, but there was nothing they could do. Because if you have a young child with you, you have to take them to the field with you and work. And then we talk a lot about farm later, but I love her story. I love and it's heart wrenching, but I love hearing because it's a very personal account of what life was actually like in the fields. Oliveris Mason also went on to describe the living conditions that awaited her family and others in Michigan and the Midwest. So they experienced all types of things, but she says, quote, one farmer had a great big barn where they used to keep their animals. And then they built another barn. And because they had more cows and things, they needed a new barn. So the old one, we used that for housing, but it was just one big, huge barn. We had to use blankets or sheets or cardboard, and you kind of created divided rooms. And then they had a couple stoves, so we all had to take turns using the stoves. But many times we lived under conditions where they didn't have housing and we have to sleep in our cars and trucks. We go into a ditch and there'd be water and we just bathe in that way. Now in Traverse City, we were lucky because the lake was across from the farm. So we just go and bathe in the lake and do our laundry there, unquote. Other migrants would describe living in rows of buildings, each with two or three rooms, each with no plumbing, no electricity. Though wood for the stoves was provided for the winter months. One migrant even remembered that it was a barn converted into apartments. Another one talked about living in chicken coops. This was not quality housing. This was the worst of the worst. They put Mexicanos where animals were supposed to live. And, they, and people in the North didn't care. This is in the rural areas. Even if they make it into the cities, into the urban centers, they were often forced to live in segregated areas in filth. For example, there was a U.S. Senate hearing regarding agricultural labor supply that reported the need 
Again, this is a Senate report saying we need to help the quote small Mexican colony living dangerously close to the railroad tracks. The report described saying the meatpacking companies surrounded the colony on all sides, including the high grade products corporation that was within 100 feet of this living establishment. It was said that, quote, the odor from these packing houses was frightfully offensive, unquote. Additionally, this small Mexican colony, they were living in boxcar homes. And in some instances, with, within arm's reach, six feet of the railroad tracks. So imagine you live in this boxcar home, you're six feet from the railroad track, surrounded this putrid stench and odor from the chemical from the chemicals from the plant. This is your this is your home. One surveyor who did this report said that, quote, in addition to the odor from the meatpacking houses, I noticed three filthy chicken cars standing alongside the boxcar homes. And by wading in the mud between the boxcar home and the chickens, you could easily touch both at the same time. The refuge and filth were scattered along the tracks. The toilets or privies used by these people was roughly thrown together shacks four or five feet square and are as close in some distances as three feet from the end of their car, end of the boxcar home. There is no sewage or sanitary facilities attached to the toilets. And when filled up, they are picked up and moved a few feet and another hole is dug in the ground. And the former location is filled with dirt, but there's no lime or disinfectant used. Wow, unquote. They're living in filth, not by choice, but to survive. This is the only space they had. That was Detroit. Let's talk about Chicago for a minute. In Chicago, it was described that families were living across from the Santa Fe railroad tracks in boxcars that were like metal ovens in the summer and freezers in the winter. Touching the walls would either burn your fingertips or could cause frostbite. But it was said that Mexicanos tried to make the best of a horrible situation. They would add porches, maintain potted plants, decorate the outside of the boxcars, try to create a sense of pride in agency and belonging, despite the difficult economic and living conditions. At first glance, the creation of a strong community seems difficult because of the temporary nature of living structures but they did their best. And the thing is they were forced to do this because they were forbidden to purchase homes or apartments in good areas. As one Irish policeman in 1928 explained, quote, Mexicans depreciate property value, unquote. One historian researching Chicago pointed out that Mexicans were often charged higher rental fees compared to other groups. And told of, it's a sad but funny story of one group who were very light skinned Mexicanos who were able to pass off as Irish. They were negotiating, hey, I'm gonna take this apartment, I will rent it, here's the price. But when they finally got it, he let his tongue slip and said, que bueno. And immediately the person showing the, the rental house said, no, you're Mexican, you're charged more. One person, one survey of the time who had interviewed South Chicago resident, residents for a congressional um, hearing, experienced the, Michi or experienced the Mexican living conditions firsthand, writing, quote, the average South Chicago Mexican live like cattle. Three to four families occupy a space ordinarily used by one American family. 
Now, of course, this is going to lead to racial stereotypes. People are going to assume, Anglos are going to assume that many towns are dirty, disease-ridden. But they had no choice to leave. They weren't allowed to rent in better areas. They couldn't afford the homes. So they were forced to live in these areas by necessity due to treatment by Anglos. And then they are criticized for living in squalor, in filth, and having disease. We talked about the living conditions. We talked about the working in the fields. What about working in factories? Well, in the factories, Mexicanos, like, like Blacks, were given the hottest, hardest, dirtiest, most dangerous jobs. Job assignments in the 1920s were based on the presupposition that they were, quote, used to working the harder, hotter, more menial tasks. One said that conditions at foundries were such that, quote, only the strong men can stand it, and it kills them, unquote. Another Mexicano recounted that, quote, young men go to work for the gray iron foundry in Saginaw, Michigan, in the full bloom of health, and within a year or two, they fade and die. In the hot summer days, the Mexican boys frequently faint at their task. Tuberculosis results from inhaling the gas and then going out of the hot room into the cold Michigan air, sometimes with their clothing wet with sweat, unquote. So they're still experiencing racism. But racism in Michigan and the Midwest did operate differently from what Mexicanos experienced in Texas. There was no official color line that specifically denoted no Mexicans allowed, as there was not a historical population of Mexicanos in the region. And of course, darker complected Mexicanos would experience the harshest form of discriminatory segregation. They would be segregated on streetcars, segregated at movies, often having to attend the movie theater designated just for blacks, or to be forced to sit in the balcony seats, the cheap seats, usually reserved for African Americans. Even celebrating the Fiestas Patrias could be a chance to racialize Mexicanos as outsiders. In fact, for one of your upcoming assignments, you have to analyze how one 1926 DAC celebration was used by whites as a spectacle to, quote, come and behold. But for now, we're going to end here and come back with, well, what is going on in the Roaring Twenties. So until then, take care and bye-bye.